But what will happen is that an arrangement will be come to with Zahawi and that he will step down as Conservative Party chairman. Uh, um, but the fact that it's taken so long for it to happen um, and that um, uh, Sunak was content to say, uh, I found out um, the details about his dealings with HMRC and I still didn't want to sack him. I, I think that's left uh, an indelible stain uh, upon the reputation of the Conservative Party. Brendan. I thought we should talk today about whether the standards of ethics in British public life have declined as a result of Brexit. What is your view on that? Well, I certainly think they've declined, and I think Brexit has played a large role in it. Um, they're two questions. Let me answer them separately. Um, the past two or three years have really been a, a very toxic period in British politics. We've had the, the breaking of the COVID regulations, the cronyism to do with um, the COVID contracts, the um, resignation of various supposed ethical advisors, the ignoring of their advice. Um, we've had the controversy about the redecoration of, of Downing Street. And today, or in the past few days, we found out about the chairman of the BBC having facilitated a, a, a loan for the then Prime Minister Boris Johnson, when he was in financial difficulties. This, this is a, a very toxic background, and uh, I think it's led to a disillusionment with democratic politics, which is very, very dangerous. There's a, a shoulder-shrugging indifference to politicians. Well, they're all like that. Um, uh, we can't expect anything better of them. But the culmination of this process, I think, has been uh, the matter of Mr. Sahawi. Uh, that um, Rishi Sunak should think that um, somebody who's had who'd been plausibly reported um, to have needed to pay a, a million pounds or something like that in fines to the HMRC, somebody who was Chancellor of the Exchequer at the time when he was in negotiations with the H HMRC, uh, and somebody who uh, seems very plausibly, it's reported, um, to have attempted to use legal means to prevent scrutiny of his um, of his financial affairs. Um, I think that's, um, that's truly shocking. Um, and I think that um, what Sunak and his friends have done and the ministers have done is, is almost worse than the original um, behaviour of Sahawi, which I, I, I think um, seems to have been pretty bad. But how does this tie in with the Brexit process, do you think? Well, I think you, you have to look precisely at what um, Sunak said last week. His first reaction when quizzed on this issue was to say, um, uh, all Sahawi's tax affairs are declared and up to date. Um, and that was a, an irresponsible thing to say, which no one could have said who, who was concerned with the truth of, of his utterances. Uh, he only needed to ask Sahawi for some further details of his tax affairs to find out um, what the position was. Uh, a week later, when he sets up an inquiry, it is clearly an attempt to, to conceal uh, and to postpone the recognition of the reality um, rather than to, to um, bring out the truth. Uh, and I think that uh, I wouldn't necessarily accuse Sunak of lying. But I think I, I would accuse, accuse him in this of, of, of indifference and carelessness to the truth. And I think that was very much at the heart of the Brexit process. Um, Brexit was based uh, on a carelessness for the truth. Um, and there were a number of layers to that carelessness of the truth. How can this be uh, corrected uh, in the absence of addressing the issue of Brexit and the lies that were associated with it? I mean, are we in a a situation where this whole situation of the deterioration of the role of truth in politics has to be addressed. Well, uh, I think that you're right, that as, as long as we have Brexit, um, there will always be this, this great void in the, um, uh, in the connection with reality of, of British politics. It's worth um, stressing um, uh, a little bit more about the, um, the hostility to truth, the absence of truth in, in the Brexit referendum, because it, it does throw a light um, on the present um, carelessness with which um, particularly conservative politicians uh, address all political topics. Um, there were the specific um, claims of um, figures that were, were dodgy about the National Health Service, about the budget. Uh, there were fig there were meaningless slogans about how we're going to take back control and it's going to have it going to be a cakewalk. We're going to have our cake and eat it. None of this was true, but the remarks and the ideas were propagated on the basis that the people 
saying them and parroting them, didn't necessarily believe those slogans. Um, people associated with the Leave campaign have admitted um, that they didn't necessarily regard as a, a firmly established, factually established, um, the, um, uh, the things they were saying, but they were the appropriate things to say at the time in order to get a, a, a certain political resonance to persuade people um, that Brexit w w was a good idea. Um, and I think that since um, the referendum, and indeed before the referendum, um, Brexit has always been associated with equivocation and carelessness with the truth. It goes back to, to before the referendum itself, and it's continued since the referendum of 2016. How would the corrosive effect of this uh, culture of, of lying, effectively, uh, be upon the underlying institutions of the state. I mean, of, there's been talk about the status of parliament being under, under threat. There's been the question uh, over the position of the judiciary, um, the role of, of uh, the Brexiteers in, in manipulating uh, the, the rule of law in some respects in order to achieve Brexit. Uh, it does seem that many of our institutions, and this now <laughs> includes, I suppose, uh, the conduct of uh, the inland revenue um, are seem to be um, debased by this whole process. And that surely is the real risk. Well, I, I don't think it's a, a risk. Uh, I think it's something which um, has been happening and is happening and is, is essential um, uh, at the heart of Brexit because Brexit um, can't be made to work. It's something which is of its nature damaging and undermining of our country, perhaps even more damaging than, than Remainers like, like us uh, realised at the time. I, I'm afraid I didn't anticipate the, um, the, the, the debasement uh, of our institutions and the threat to the constitutional stability of the United Kingdom entirely um, that, uh, that has, has come about. Um, but if we go back to before the referendum, uh, there was this hope that uh, somehow Cameron would be able to set aside and re resolve the issues of Brexit, of our relationship with the European Union. He thought it was possible to turn on and off his hostility to the European Union. Um, that was a, a careless and thoughtless way of going about things. And I, I think we're, we're still seeing the legacy of it today. Uh, if you ask about the institutions, I, I, I think it, it is necessary um, as, as a matter of cleansing um, to have a change of government. Um, but I think that as far as the European issue is concerned, it, it's very much, um, the jury is very much out uh, about whether the, the Labour Party uh, at the moment has uh, any more um, uh, valid or, or thought out attitude towards the European Union than the present Conservative government. Uh, uh, Brexit can't be made to work. And, and that's true, whether it's Boris Johnson, Rishi Sunak or, or Keir Starmer saying it. Well, quite. I mean, this evasion of uh, the Brexit issue uh, by the opposition, particularly by the Labour Party, uh, seems to be an extension of this uh, of, of this callous approach to the truth of our, our national condition. Uh, I mean, it may not be quite as, as blatant as, as the uh, untruths which are associated with claiming that Brexit is working, which is clearly the government's position, more or less, um, but it is nevertheless part of the same phenomenon, surely. Um, it... it, it... It is related, um, and I think it's important to stress that it's a less virulent uh, condition than the present government. Um, my my hope, and I'm not sure whether it's my expectation, my hope is, is that um, as the pressure of circumstances and facts builds up uh, over the next four or five years, um, the Labour Party, a Labour government, may be um, potentially and capable of being um, more responsive um, to the, the evidence of the external world. It seems to me evident that the Conservative Party in its present state uh, isn't in any way responsive to the pressures from the outside world. Um, we see that in the, the absurd um, legislation which is being proposed about the EU retained law legislation, um, which is going to cause to all economic actors the most uh, extraordinary confusion and is only being put forward in a desperate attempt to make Brexit work and pretend that, um, that there are benefits, economic, political, social, um, that flow from Brexit. Um, they, they don't. Um, and this bill is simply going to make things worse. 
Yes, coming back to the, the shorter term, the immediate situation, I mean, do you feel that this crisis over uh, Zahawi's finances um, could lead to Rishi Sunak actually collapsing, is his premiership collapsing? Um, in, in the medium term, it may. I, I don't think it will in, in the short term. Uh, I, I think that what will happen is that an arrangement will be come to with Zahawi and that he will step down as Conservative Party chairman. Uh, um, but the fact that it's taken so long for it to happen um, and that um, uh, Sunak was content to say, uh, I found out uh, the details about his dealings with HMRC and I still didn't want to sack him. I, I think that's left uh, an indelible stain uh, upon the reputation of the Conservative Party, which I, I think um, uh, Keir Starmer, Prime Minister's question time today, uh, might have done more to drive home. I, I wasn't very impressed by um, by his uh, assault and criticism this, uh, this afternoon. But you feel it's weakened uh, the Prime Minister's position so that should he face further difficulties and further challenge, I mean, he has been seen as, as this figure who can keep the, the show on the road uh, until the next general election, or despite rumours of attempted returns by Boris Johnson and the rest. But actually further turmoil inside the Conservative Party and potentially even a challenge to Rishi Sunak's leadership has been made perhaps more lightly by this whole saga. Well, the Conservative Party is in a, such a febrile and, and divided state um, that it's damned if it does and damned if it doesn't, and its leader is in the same position. Um, uh, uh, perhaps only a weak leader uh, can keep the show on the road because a strong leader would be more quickly toppled by the um, uh, the opponents of whatever line or whatever ideas he or she was advocating. Um, I, I don't think it's quite right to say that Sunak is weak. Um, I, I think he has very few resources, um, but it may be his weakness that keeps him in, in place um, because the, the conflicting wings of the Conservative Party can't agree on his successor. Well, we will see, presumably, uh, with the next test of his uh, leadership and his capacity to face uh, the truth of the situation in which he's in, uh, with the coming debate on the Northern Ireland Protocol and how that proceeds. Brendan, many thanks for this, and we will um, continue with further videos on the same topic. Thank you very much.